Hey there, I'm Nathan Agan, and welcome to the Working Actor's Journey. Today's episode is a bit of a special one. It's a mini Shakespeare masterclass with Dakin Matthews, and this is taken from the full conversation with Dakin in episode number 12. If you heard the episode with Dakin, you know what an accomplished actor, teacher, and scholar he is. Now, one of the first ideas I had for this podcast was if it would be possible to find a way for all the great actors and teachers I've known to share what they've learned and what they can pass on. In the full episode with Dakin, we actually talk about if you could do an online Shakespeare or acting class, and I'm still curious to explore this. So that's kind of what we have here today. It's where Dakin talks at length about a specific speech from Romeo and Juliet. And it's a bit of what he would do if he were actually working with an actor in a masterclass on this speech. And so what I want to know is, is there a place for content like this? Is this engaging and helpful to you? Would you want more things like this? Maybe it would be additional podcast episodes, or maybe we could do actual online group classes. I mean, there's so many tools out there, I have to believe that we could find a way to make this work if enough people want it. So let me know what you think of this episode. You can get in touch on Twitter, at working underscore actors, or leave a message or comment on workingactorsjourney.com. In this episode, we'll be talking about Juliet's speech in Act 4, Scene 3 from Romeo and Juliet before she drinks the potion from Friar Lawrence. You'll learn the logic that Juliet uses and how it unravels, the structure of what Shakespeare wrote and its function in the play, where you need to be at the end of the speech if you're performing it, how both male and female actors tend to shy away from emotion and a lot more. So here we go with the mini Shakespeare Masterclass with Dakin Matthews. Can we take a look at Romeo and Juliet? Uh, Yeah, I'll just, yeah, this is something that I discovered the last Masterclass I gave. A girl wanted to do the vile speech from Romeo and Juliet, which and I had, and that's the other great thrill for me when I do master classes and somebody picks a speech that I have never done. Mm-hmm. Then I'm going to learn a lot more about it than they ever do. Sure. So she wanted to do the vial speech, which along with, you know, um, come Romeo, come, you know, uh, gallop a pace are the two really wonder, two of the w- really wonderful pieces for, for Juliet. Almost, Im- almost impossible pieces for Juliet in many ways. So she did it. And I was um, I was watching her, and she was doing pretty well. And then she got to the end of the speech, and it made oddly no sense what her choice at that point. It didn't make any sense, and I couldn't figure out what exactly it was. And the thing that uh, I focus on a lot with young actors now when they work on scenes like that is not just to understand each line of the speech, not just to understand each word of the speech, but to understand the overall structure of the speech. This is Act Act 4, Scene 3. She she sends the nurse away, then she tries to call the nurse back. Then she says, no, I don't want her. She has nothing to do with me. This is where I have to do. My dismal scene, I needs must act alone. And she says, come vile. So she takes out the little poison. Then she says, what if this mixture do not work at all? Shall I be married then tomorrow morning? No, no. This, and she holds up a dagger, shall forbid it. Then she puts the dagger next to her bed or under her pillow, wherever it is. Lie thou there. Then she says, What if it be a poison which the friar subtly hath ministered to have me dead, lest in this marriage he should be dishonored because he married me before to Romeo? I fear it is. And yet methinks it should not, for he hath still been tried a holy man. Then she says, how if, when I'm laid into the tomb, I wake before the time that Romeo come to redeem me? There's a fearful point. Shall I not then be stifled in the vault, to whose foul mouth no healthsome air breathes in, and there die strangled, ere my Romeo comes? Or, 
If I live, is it not very like the horrible conceit of death and night, together with the terror of the place, as in a vault, an ancient receptacle, where for this many hundred years the bones of all my buried ancestors are packed, where bloody Tybalt, yet but green in earth, lies festering in his shroud, where, as they say, at some hours in the night spirits resort, alack, alack, is it not like that I, so early waking, what with loathsome smells and shrieks like mandrakes torn out of the earth, that living mortals hearing them run mad? Or, if I wake, shall I not be distraught, environed with all these hideous fears, and madly play with my forefather's joints, and pluck the mangled Tybalt from his shroud, and in this rage with some great kinsman's bone, as with a club dash out my desperate brains? Oh, look! Methinks I see my cousin's ghost seeking out Romeo that did spit his body upon a rapier's point. Stay, Tybalt, stay! Romeo, Romeo, Romeo! Here's drink, I drink to thee. Okay, tough little speech. But if you don't understand the shape, you miss the essential dynamic of the speech. What this girl did was she got to the end and then she went, Romeo, 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 here's drink, I drink to thee. She thought that quietness was the important thing to do at the end of the speech. And of course, what Shakespeare's written here is what's called a passion. An emotional speech by a single character that is meant to exhibit a a passionate response to something. But more importantly, he's written a speech about a a little girl who's 14 years old, who's facing a dilemma. So she says, okay, here's the bottle. And she first says, what if it doesn't work? What if it doesn't work? Am I going to have to marry again the second time tomorrow? No, no. Ah, there's a knife. I I brought the knife. I can solve that problem. So she goes, question one. If it doesn't work, what are my options? Do I have a solution? Yes, I got a knife. Good. Done. Wait a minute. There's another option. What if it works too well? What if it kills me? I think it might be. What's his motive? He's afraid he'll be caught out for marrying me first. So he'll kill me so he won't be caught out for that. Do I have a solution? Do I have an answer for that? No, I don't think that's possible. He's, 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 he's a good guy. He wouldn't do that. So the first one, she has a very definitive answer. She knows what she's going to do. The second one, she says, what if it doesn't work? Then just, what if it works too well? Do I have a solution for that? Not really, but I don't, he wouldn't do that. No, he, he wouldn't do that. Third question now comes up. Okay, so the question is not whether it won't work or whether it will work. But what if it doesn't quite work the way it's supposed to work and I wake up early? Oh, my God. I'd be in a tomb where there hasn't been any fresh air for years. And I would suffocate to death. That would be horrible. Does she have a solution for that? Does she have an answer for that question? No. So what's happening? First one, it might be this. Well, I can solve that. Second one, it could be this. I don't, I don't think that would be it. Third one, what about this? And she has no answer for that. So clearly, she starts off with a kind of rational start and a rational answer. A second start, not a very good answer. Third one, no answer at all. Instead of having an answer for that, she says, wake up too early and then I would, I would choke to death. Or if I don't choke to death, if I wake up early and I don't choke to death, so logically, she's actually pursuing these questions logically, but she's losing her ability to, to deal with them. Or if I live. So I'm waking up early. I'm living. I'm not choking to death. But oh my God, I'm in this thing with all these bones and ghosts and just recently dead people and decaying people. And I'm going to look around and it's going to be smelly and it's going to be ugly. It's going to be filthy. People would go crazy. Oh God, if I wake, oh God, I'm going to go crazy myself. And I'm going to start beating myself over the head with a bone until I bash my brains out. That's her fourth one. Then she goes somewhere. She's never gone before. She goes, look, look. It's Tybalt. It's Tybalt. So now she's not even on the if happens. She's now put herself completely into that situation where she is now hallucinating. She is saying, I am now in the tomb and I'm looking around and I got this bone in my hand and I'm beating my brains out and I see Tybalt coming and oh my God, he's got his sword 
and he's going to kill, he's going to kill Romeo and Romeo's going to show up any minute. So I better get there quick. Boom. A completely insane reason to drink, to drink the vial, which is she doesn't drink it because she'll be reunited with Romeo and some loving. She drinks it because she thinks she sees Tybalt coming after Romeo with a sword and she's got to get there to get between them. Wow. Romeo. So it's, it's, it starts off with a sort of a logical idea and ends up, she r- revs, revs herself, herself up, yeah. up into this hallucination and it's probably the only way she could actually manage to drink the thing. All the other things that she said militate against her drinking it because it, it might not work. It might work too well. It would wear off too early and I wouldn't die. Everything she's going up to there, she didn't have a solution for. And then suddenly... The only thing that gets you to drink it is the, is the is the imagination, the fantasy now that she is she sees Tybalt stalking Romeo, and she 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 wants to get there to keep Tybalt dead Tybalt from killing newly arriving Romeo. So it just builds to this crescendo of uh, uh, each passion or each fear being greater than the previous one. So if you go soft at the end, you miss the entire. Structured all that build up to the climax at the end is lost by softening the last, the last thing. And also each of the five things that she goes to, it might not work. It would work too well. It had worked partially, but I'd wake up and then die of suffocation. Or I would wake up and I wouldn't die, but I'd break my brains out. Or Tybalt would come alive and he'd go try to kill Romeo. Up to the point of that last Tibble thing, each one of them gets bigger. Each one gets longer. The first first problem, done within four lines. Second problem, six lines. Third problem, eight lines or so, you know. Fifth problem just goes on and on and on and on. And it's, it, it's this expanding sort of shape. If you said, what's the shape of this speech? It's these, it's these lines that start, to, they just fan out and they never meet. It just becomes so... Yeah, it yeah. becomes so massive that it tips beyond control. And it's, it's, it's a speech in which she starts in control and loses control. So to pull it back down to a small, a quiet point is, is antagonistic to the dynamic of the speech. Do you see as a pattern actors shying away from that kind of emotional... From climaxes? Yes. There are two problems that most American actors make. They're kind of the same problem. A great passion, a great speech is like an aria. It has a musical structure. And it is normally clearly marked where the emotional climaxes are in a speech. If you know how to read the rhetoric and you're the people. Men don't tend to be sensitive to the structure of the speech and they begin, they first of all try to play almost all passionate speeches angry. And they don't attach the anger to the exact point where anger or passion is called for in the speech. They will just randomly choose a place where they'll get angry. There is no randomness in a Shakespeare soliloquy. Everything is structured. And if you attach your emotion, your passion, your anger to a place that is not supported by the speech itself. The audience is confused. They don't. They don't see. You know, suit the word to the action. The action. The word means not just only gesture when it calls for it. It means when you are acting. It is the text that has to tell you what the emotional dynamic is. So uh, I think most male actors think I'm. I'm just going to get really loud now. Now I'm going to get really soft. Now I'm going to get really loud again. Now I'm going to get really soft. They think just variation of, of, of volume or intensity is somehow what the speech calls for, irrespective of what the structure of the speech actually is. So that's one common mistake that, that many actors make. For women, it's slightly different. I think, in my experience, women have a much better sense of structures of speeches, but climaxes f- frighten them. Because the climax almost always insists that you use full volume, that you indicate that you reach the peak of your uh, uh, emotional intensity at the same moment that you reach the peak of your vocal intensity. And 
too many women, either because of insecurity or because they're untrained, feel that if they go that last step, they will sound ugly and shrill. Mm. So I've seen so many women build perfectly to a climax and soften away. Or it may also be the inherent misogyny in a patriarchal culture that, that refuses to let women have the full expression. To lose control to some their, degree. Right? Of their yeah. emotion. That men will be put off by that. So the solution to that is a fearlessness, but also a trained voice so that no matter how vocally intense you become at a certain point, the voice is not ugly. Right. Or off-putting. You know what I mean? So that's that's the hard part. It, 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 there's a lot of them where it's true like that. I mean, Paulina, of course, has a couple where she should get ugly. Uh, Hermione sure. has some, certainly. Um, Gallop Pace has some in that regard. A lot of them have that where you simply have to have the vocal skill mm-hmm. to sing, to hit the high notes without losing the technical beauty and strength of the, of the thing. And that is um, that is, results from a clear understanding of how this what's not only what the speech is about, but the particular structure of the speech, especially if it's a, a speech where it steps up as this one does. This one clearly goes boom, 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 and you can't go boom. Sure, everything you built up is lost if you don't go ahead and push yourself to that climax. Uh, Lady Percy's speech in that part two is climaxes the line that goes, him, oh, him, oh, wondrous him, you know, him, oh, him, oh, wondrous him. If you if you back away from that, it's just crazy because actually, I think it's Shakespeare's pun, it's a him to her husband. H-Y-M-N. H-Y-M-N. Yeah. And, and that's just like just like Juliet's uh, gallop of pace is a little is a little sexual self excitement on come 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 Romeo come. I mean, it's Shakespeare deliberately builds that kind of a climactic structure into so many of the great speeches, and you just have to uh, honor it. You have yeah, to stay with it. No, that was that was great, and it was probably a lot of fun for you to to visually see that as you're working through it with the with yeah, because it's something I had not noticed before. One always thinks that she takes the poison. At that moment, so that she can fulfill the friar's directive, plan. Yeah, yeah. Which, to some sense, she does, but the emotional reason why she takes the poison, like the emotional reason why Hamlet kills Claudius, is because Claudius killed Gertrude, not because Claudius killed his father. It's in the rush of the moment where the queen says, The king, the king, he did it. And Hamlet goes off and revenges the one person he didn't want to revenge the entire play. Right. He revenges his mother instead of his father. Mm. Just That's just wonderful Shakespeare stuff. You know, yeah. That's true to revenge play, too. You always revenge the, for the wrong reasons. Oh, okay. That's very typical. Huh. Hey, guys. Nathan here one more time. And as I mentioned, I'd love to know if you want to hear more episodes like this. Tweet to the show at working underscore actors or leave a comment or message at workingactorsjourney.com. If you're not already subscribed and you enjoy what you heard, click subscribe so you don't miss anything ahead. And if you can take a minute to rate and review this in iTunes or wherever you find podcasts, that will help others find out about this show. I appreciate all comments and thank you so much for doing that. Be sure to visit workingactorsjourney.com slash podcast for the show notes and links for today's episode. You can also follow the show on Twitter and Instagram. I'm Nathan Agan, and thanks for listening. Thank you.